Well, good afternoon, all. Greetings from Malibu, California. I'm Pete Peterson, the very grateful Dean of Pepperdine's Graduate Policy School, and I am delighted to welcome you to the first of a four-part webinar series uh, titled No Way to Treat a Child. This will be a series exploring various aspects of America's foster care and youth service programs. Uh, we'll be exploring them through a variety of lenses, uh, both the government role, also nonprofits, and specifically uh, the faith-based nonprofits role in these issues. Uh, and today, uh, for session one, you see the title of this session, What is Child Maltreatment and How Should Government Respond to It? Uh, for this, in each of the four sessions, I'm delighted uh, to be working with Naomi Schaefer-Riley. I will pass the baton to her in a second. Um, but this series is based very much on her a uh, very important book that I hope if you haven't picked it up, uh, you consider doing so, also titled No Way to Treat a Child. Uh, at the School of Public Policy, we very much are focused on preparing the next generation of leaders for both the government and nonprofit sectors. And certainly a large number of our students are going into um, the work at the local level in cities and counties and working on issues like foster care and youth services. And as you'll all know and come to understand maybe in some new ways over the course of these next few months, uh, this is an area that all Americans should be deeply concerned about. It's one that uniquely uh, engages each one of our major sectors, uh, including government, nonprofits, as well as the private sector, but it's also very much one that uh, is of deep concern here to the policy school, concerned as we are with how public policy impacts uh, what the Bible would call the least of these. And that is certainly the case uh, in our foster care and youth services programs. I'll introduce uh, today's uh, speaker, again, who will be interviewed by Naomi, uh, Dr. Sarah Font. Sarah is an associate professor of sociology and public policy at Penn State University. Uh, her research assesses the outcomes of children who experience abuse and neglect and the efficacy of the child welfare system in preventing re-victimization and adverse health and development outcomes. Uh, we will be sending along a link to her work uh, in uh, following uh, up on this particular session, so you'll get a chance to learn more about her work. And of course, uh, Naomi Schaefer Riley uh, will be leading this and each of these uh, four sessions here as part of this series. She is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and focuses on issues of child welfare as well as uh, a senior fellow at IWF. She has written widely about parenting, higher education, religion, philanthropy, and culture. Uh, former columnist for the New York Post, uh, wrote the book, Till Faith Do Us Part, How Interfaith Marriage is Transforming America. Uh, but her writing is uh, seen and read widely uh, from the Wall Street Journal to the New York Times, uh, the Boston Globe, and LA Times. And uh, it, this, series also originated on a talk that she gave here on campus back in January in which we interviewed uh, a couple people who are working on uh, these issues here in Los Angeles County. And that conversation and that event prompted Naomi and I uh, talking about creating a more in-depth series in which uh, Naomi would introduce us to the many experts and policymakers she's been working with uh, in the course of uh, publishing and writing her very important book. So I know that you're going to learn a lot from this session, but again, know that this is just the first of a four-part monthly series that we'll be uh, hosting over the course of the fall semester here. And so without any further ado, uh, Naomi, I'll turn it over to you back east. 
Thank you so much, Dean Peterson. I am so excited to be able to do this. And um, I just want to thank all of you who have tuned in today. Um, the topic that we're going to talk about today usually only sparks the interest of policymakers uh, when there's some kind of high profile tragedy, a child fatality, uh, when there's a class action lawsuit, uh, or when people are arguing over the budgets for child welfare departments. Um, but I think that uh, it's useful to, to think about these issues um, outside of sort of those high profile and sometimes emergency situations. Um, I hope that today by having more uh, policymakers, journalists, and just citizens really understand the risks to children uh, from maltreatment, that we can do a better job of creating and reforming these systems, both on the local and the federal level. Um, so I'm so excited that uh, Sarah Font has joined me here today. Just a, a quick note, uh, Sarah is a member of the working group uh, on child welfare that I have at the American Enterprise Institute. Um, it's a bipartisan group of folks who are former agency heads, judges, uh, folks who are academic researchers and nonprofit leaders. And we get together a couple of times a year to talk about the, the most vexing issues in child welfare. And we also uh, sometimes put out policy papers on that as well. So uh, Sarah is one of the workhorses of the group and I'm excited that she has agreed to join me here today. Um, I want to start by asking you, Sarah, if you can Describe the scope of the problem that we're talking about here. Um, there are about 73 million children in the United States today. How many of them are at risk for maltreatment and what exactly are they at risk for? Sure, so uh, according to recent federal estimates, nearly 8 million children a year are referred to Child Protective Services. A lot of those cases don't get investigated for various reasons and only about uh, a little under 700,000 children each year are officially determined to be victims of maltreatment. And what that means is that an investigator has gone out and found evidence that they think is sufficient to say this child has been victimized under um, you know, the specific state statute that defines abuse and neglect. Um, but if we look across the life course, what we actually know is that a lot more children are exposed to maltreatment. Um, about a third of children uh, in the course of their lifetime will be investigated by CPS, which sounds like a massive number, and it is, um, but it also is not super out of line with what we know from survey data in terms of how many children report that they've been physically abused, sexually abused, or neglected. So we do have a massive problem with child maltreatment, and um, a lot of those cases are not uh, going to get accurately labeled as maltreatment at the time it happened by CPS. Mm. Who, who is reporting them for maltreatment? We have, uh, you know, most states have laws about mandated reporters. So those are people who are like teachers or social workers or police officers. Where are most of the reports coming in from? Um, you know, who is who is calling uh, CPS and are they just calling CPS? Are they calling the police? How are the reports originally uh, initially coming into our systems? So each state gets to define who it considers a mandatory reporter. So in some states, that's everyone. Every citizen um, or resident of the state is a mandatory reporter. In other states, it's primarily professionals who interact with children on a regular basis. And those laws are often getting expanded over time. So I'm in Pennsylvania, um, where the Jerry Sandusky sexual abuse scandal led to a big expansion of our mandatory reporting laws because it was determined that there were people who knew or should have known that children were at risk, but they weren't, they didn't fall under that group of people who had to report. So that's a kind of influx um, thing. Uh, most people who report are professionals, but there's a lot of relatives who call in when they're concerned about something that's happening in their family that they can't um, control, uh, neighbors and other people who interact with the family outside of professional responsibilities also report. Mm. So you, uh, you worked at one point for one of these agencies. Um, can you describe a little bit kind of what it's like to go out and try to figure out what's going on in a home? What are we asking uh, folks who are in Child Protective Services to do? How do, they, how do they know when a child has been abused or neglected? Um, you know, just to give some context, I think a lot of people read 
some of the headlines you find, you know, a child, you know, or many children have been, you know, kept in a basement for months and, um, you know, oh, we had no idea what was going on in the home next door. And it's, it's very hidden. Um, do you find that uh, most of the investigations that are done are being done in, uh, in homes where nobody had any idea what was going on for years or that there's something uh, more out in the open and happening that no one is quite acknowledging? Yeah, so the investigative process can be really challenging for a few different reasons. Um, one is that, right, the, the parents who are often also the accused perpetrators don't have to uh, give an interview. They don't have to allow you access to their home. Um, and if they don't, then you have to demonstrate to a court that there's reasonable cause for the court to order that to happen. Um, and so that can be a real hurdle uh, when families want to keep what's happening private. Um, and of course, people lie. Um, people lie about all sorts of things. So discerning who's telling the truth and who's not can be very challenging, especially when um, the child victim is either too young to tell you themselves what has happened or not happened, or um, a lot of times we're talking about children who have significant disabilities and um, they also have difficulty communicating what, what they've experienced. Hmm. Let's, I just wanted to sort of also just drill down to that a little bit. You mentioned that some of the children that you're trying to interview are quite young. What is the, what's the age distribution like uh, when you're thinking about um, children who are in the child welfare system? Um, is, it, is it mostly older kids or younger kids? And I wonder if this is also a good time to sort of explain what we mean, because uh, we're, we're talking about child maltreatment, we're, we're talking about physical abuse, sexual abuse, and neglect. So maybe specifically what we mean by neglect, because there's a lot of confusion around that point in particular. Yeah, so a lot of people talk about the fact that the vast majority of cases investigated by CPS um, are allegations of neglect. And so I just first want to say that's partly by design. So sexual abuse comprises a pretty small share of the child protective services system because child protective services is really only responsible for maltreatment that it occurs by a parent or a person responsible for the child. So in general, if you know our child, uh, if you're a parent and your child is injured by someone not in your home, you're responsible for contacting the police, making sure that the child is protected going forward. CPS comes in when there's no one to fill that role. And so um, cases where it's someone outside the home and the parents are protective, law enforcement handles those. Mm -hmm. so, um, the so then the remaining cases are largely physical abuse and neglect. And neglect uh, can be a couple of different things, um, but the basic idea is a child has been neglected when they are not provided with minimally adequate care. And what that means is their basic needs are met. So um, you know, they're fed, um, they are taken to the doctor if they're injured or ill, um, and they're adequately supervised, so they're not wandering the streets in the middle of the night, that sort of stuff. And so this sometimes uh, people say, well, that, you know, what if that's just poverty, the child doesn't have housing, for example. So a lot of states have explicit exemptions that something is not considered neglect if it occurs solely for the reasons of poverty. Uh, but often what comes to the attention of CPS is neglect that occurs because a parent, uh, their capacity is limited by things like serious mental illness and substance use. And so uh, studies generally show that substance abuse comprises a very large proportion of overall CPS involvement and neglect in particular. Mm. So, I mean, what happens with neglect? I think you, you do hear this a lot that we're taking children, we're separating children from their parents because of poverty. We're punishing poverty is a, is a common refrain heard about the child welfare system. Um, and I think one of the things that people sort of fail to grasp is the possibility that the reason this family is experiencing poverty is also the same reason that the children are experiencing maltreatment. So something like a serious substance abuse problem or a serious mental illness might prevent not only that parent from getting a job, it might prevent that parent from seeking out uh, help. I mean, there have been, there's sort of been, um, it was uh, some interesting uh, research done a number of years ago. Uh, a lot of researchers assumed that 
um, the, the reports leading up to a child fatality, it would be like, first there'd be a black eye and then there'd be a bruise. And then, you know, then they would find out that the child, uh, you know, had been murdered or killed. Um, in fact, what they found was that the, the, the events that preceded that fatality tended more often to be like the electricity had been turned off in the house. There was no running water in the house. Uh, the child didn't have, you know, a coat and when it was, you know, 10 degrees out or something like that. And those things, which, you know, we can argue about the, the size of the safety net we have in this country, but there's no reason a child in this country should be living in a home without running water or heat at this point. Um, but if a parent uh, doesn't have the wherewithal to go seek out that help, uh, you know, that child is going to be stuck, particularly um, a young child. Now, that's what that was the other part of the question I wanted to ask you about was about the age of kids that we're talking about with maltreatment. What's what's yeah. typical? Um, so I just want to say one other thing related to what you uh, mentioned about substance abuse is that a lot of neglect cases also either co-occur with or lead to physical and sexual abuse because when a parent's capacities are really limited, they can't engage in basic gatekeeping functions. They're not in control of who has access to their child. So um, we often see initial reports for neglect that later those same kids show up for physical or sexual abuse. Um, so the basic... Uh, in terms of age, it really depends what you mean in terms of in the child welfare system. So we overwhelmingly intervene with really young children. And that makes sense in the, to the extent that um, they're the most vulnerable to fatality and they're fully dependent on the capacity of their parents. Um, children of all ages get reported. But most children who get reported later um, in childhood or adolescence have been reported before, often multiple times. So it's pretty unusual to have your very first uh, concern about maltreatment come about as a um, eight, nine, 10 year old or older. Uh, it usually starts early. So I wanted to pick up on two of the things you said. Uh, first of all, the gatekeeping function. Um, you know, I wanted to talk for a minute about kind of who it is um, who could be responsible for that physical abuse. I mean, the a, a lot of people who just simply read the headlines about any kind of child maltreatment, child abuse, uh, they would quickly see how common it was uh, for uh, the mother's boyfriend to be somehow involved in the physical abuse of a child. And the, the likelihood that a non-relative male uh, living in the home or, you know, having a, a lot of interaction with the child um, is going to be the perpetrator seems quite high. Um, what, what is behind that? Do you, uh, can you talk a little bit about the dynamics there? Um, you know, I know sometimes the, the mother is, you know, feels dependent on a particular man, either for financial reasons or for access uh, to, to drugs or something like that. What is going on in those homes where you have a young child who is being abused by the non-relative male in the house? Right, so one thing to keep in mind is that the proportion of families to where there are multiple fathers is pretty high. Um, and so the non-relative adult male in the home is often a father to one of the children, but not all of them. And so that's a, that's a fairly common scenario. Um, and it's also the case that a lot of these families involve um, domestic violence, which is a known risk factor for physical and other forms of abuse in the home. And it's not just um, sort of what we typically think of as um, domestic violence where there's a male perpetrator and a female victim. It's really a lot of mutual violence and those things tend to be under, underlain by mental illness and substance use. Mm. I also wanted to talk about why it is, and maybe this seems obvious to some people, but not others, like why it is that young children are particularly at risk. I mean, obviously they have problems, you know, they, they can't care for themselves and they can't um, often alert other adults, especially if they're um, prior to school age, they can't often alert other adults if there's a problem in the home. But I often encourage, you know, people who do have either young kids themselves or have ever spent any time trying to, you know, uh, babysit for a one or two year old uh, is what I call the mobile but totally irrational stage. Uh, where kids are, you know, uh, trying to touch a hot stove or run into traffic or, you know, swallow their siblings Legos. 
and how difficult it is even as a perfectly sober person to try to monitor that and how much substance abuse can really interfere with that. I was wondering if you could sort of talk about we seem to sort of be in a shift in this country toward a, a sense that um, drugs are not a big deal. Um, and, uh, and why it is that even if they're not a big deal for uh, at least some drugs may not be a big deal for adults, um, why it is that drugs seem to have such a significant impact on the child welfare system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of relevant factors here. Uh, so one is that um, if you're a person already of limited means, your, your drug habit is going to eat up a lot of the resources that you need to take care of your children. And so there's a diversion of resources that happens that can lead to children being inappropriate care, inappropriately cared for. The other factor is a lot of the parents with child welfare system involvement have either very limited or very inappropriate social networks. So if they um, you know, are having whatever issue, there's not always a safe person that they're that can help them out. There's no one to go to to say, I need a night off, take my kids, um, in the way that a lot of parents rely on relatives, friends, neighbors, um, that doesn't exist for a lot of uh, these parents. Mm -hmm. The other thing to consider is that substance use, right, has a hereditary component, so it's intergenerational. Um, so children who are raised by people with serious addiction problems have often experienced maltreatment themselves, um, which is a risk factor for then initiating substance use. Um, and so there's a cyclical aspect to that as well, um, where uh, people who are most likely to fall victim to addiction are also um, themselves traumatized and have a lot of other co-occurring issues. Hmm. I just wanted to take a quick minute here to say that um, starting at about uh, in about 15 or 20 minutes, uh, Sarah and I are going to take a quick break to hear questions from you. Um, we'd like to spend the last 15 or 20 minutes of our time together questions from you. So if you do have questions, please put them into the chat and we will get to them in a little bit. Um, the, ne the next thing that I want to talk about a little bit, Sarah, um, is the idea of the kids who are uh, removed from their homes. Like, let's talk mm -hmm. about kind of what it is that actually um, prompts a child to be removed from their home um, and put into the foster care system. Um, and a little bit about the characteristics of those kids, like how, how long are they staying there? Um, and what do they have to do to get back with their parents? Um, you know, uh, is, is there some plan for rehabilitating parents? Like how, how does the, the kind of the next step work, you know, once we've decided something is seriously wrong, um, what, what, what is behind the removals of children from their homes? Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, so I mentioned earlier that about 8 million children are referred to CPS each year. About 250,000 enter foster care. So it's a pretty small share of that overall group that we might consider to be potentially at risk of maltreatment and experiencing then removal from the home. And the children who are removed are overwhelmingly young. Uh, so about half are under the age of five. And uh, again, it kind of looks similar to the overall picture of maltreatment. It's a, um, largely for neglect, and um, a lot of it's about substance use. I'll note that the federal numbers on the percentage of children removed where their parents have serious substance use problems is totally inaccurate and undercounted. And there's we've known for decades, based on various government reports, that it's probably about 80% of kids coming into foster care have parents who have addiction issues. Yeah. Um, so how long they stay depends very extensively on where they live. Um, so states are supposed to prioritize moving children into permanent living arrangements quickly um, under the Federal Adoption and Safe Families Act, but not all states do, and there's not a lot of enforcement there. Um, if you enter foster care in Illinois, you are gonna stay for a long time. If you enter foster care in Utah, you're going to be out pretty quickly. So there's a lot of variation there, and it depends to reunification tends to happen more quickly. Um, about two thirds of reunifications happen within 12 months. Adoptions can drag out, um, partly because states don't look for adoptive families as quickly as we might want them to, and also because 
um, the scheduling for TPR, termination of parental rights hearings, which is a prerequisite to adoption, um, tends to be heavily delayed by the courts or agencies. Yeah. Well, we should give people a little bit of an overview of kind of uh, how the child welfare system is set up. Um, it's largely run by states sometimes run by individual counties. Mm -hmm. um, and about a half of the money for child welfare is coming from the federal government. There are some federal laws that dictate um, how child welfare is supposed to be done. But as Sarah said, there is not a great deal of enforcement. And there are, there are a lot of reasons for that. I mean, nobody wants to be in the position of saying, um, we're going to withhold money from your state foster care system because you did not follow these federal laws because then you look like you're withholding money from foster kids and that is not a good look for any politician. Um, but there are other reasons too. I mean, states are uh, are kind of all over the place in terms of the reporting that they're doing to the federal government and we're relying on states to tell us, uh, you know, how many kids they have in the foster care system, uh, how long they've been there. Um, that we're relying on them to tell us, you know, how many of these cases involve substance abuse, how many involve mental illness. And every state kind of has a different way of counting these things. Um, and so it, it leads to a lot of uh, bad data coming uh, into the federal government. Um, and then a lot of difficulty sort of enforcing uh, any of the laws that are on the books. Um, as you mentioned the Adoption Safe Families Act, I should just say for people who are not familiar with it, it was passed um, in the 1990s uh, by a bipartisan Congress. Um, and the concern at the time was that kids were languishing in foster care for far too long um, and that they did not have any exit to permanency, either reunification um, or adoption uh, as, as a way out. Um, and so these legislators uh, really decided that we need to limit the amount of time kids spend in the system in this kind of um, uh, kind of holding pattern that they were in. And uh, so the, the law now says basically, um, you know, with a couple of caveats that if a child has been in foster care for 15 out of the last 22 months, the state is supposed to move toward the termination of parental rights. Um, and as Sarah said, uh, that does not happen very often uh, in a lot of states. Um, I wanted to just sort of turn next to um, the question of, uh, you know, we're going to get into this actually with our next session, which is with uh, Ronald Richter. He's a former family court judge and former head of ACS. But I wanted to give people a, a sense. You mentioned that uh, parents do not have to just allow someone from CPS to come into their home. What What is the procedure that uh, the, the state would have to go to in order to remove a child from their home? Because um, there are a lot of stories of it just sort of being done willy nilly. There's no, um, you know, due process. There's no warrant, uh, you know, and, and people are very concerned that CPS is sort of overstepping its bounds in this way. Right. Uh, so there's two different ways that states handle this. And um, I think it's about evenly divided in terms of the number of states who have each process. So um, in general, you need a court order to remove a child from the home. And that means you have to show that there is a reasonable, a reason that it's reasonable to believe that if the child were left in the home, that they would face imminent risk of harm and that there's nothing immediate that can be done. Uh, or put into place that would ameliorate that, you know, remedy that risk that would keep the child safe at home. So there's the reasonable efforts piece um, to avoid removal. And then there's the demonstration that there's an imminent threat of harm. And so in, um, there are some states, however, where if it is an emergency situation, the child can be removed without a court order. And then the court order um, would have to be obtained within usually 24 to 48 hours. So you would go to court after the removal. But in most states, um, even if it's the middle of the night, there's an on-call judge, you call them and you explain, okay, I'm at a meth lab and you know, um, the parents are you know, um, burned down the house of their meth lab, I need to remove these kids. And they would give the order at that point. Um, so yeah, there's almost always, um, you have to show evidence and you have to show that there's nothing um, short of removal that would alleviate the risk. Hmm. So I wanted to look now at some of the um, kind of more popular ideas that people have about 
uh, the child welfare system and some of the misconceptions they have. You, you talked earlier about kind of what people think neglect is, but what it actually is. Um, I wanted to talk about one increasingly common claim out there that the foster care system and child welfare more generally um, is structurally racist. Uh, we see racial disparities in terms of uh, the, the kids who are removed uh, into, into the foster care system, the kids who are investigated for maltreatment. Um, what, what is behind those numbers? Why do we see such racial disparities? And can you give, me, give us an estimate of kind of, uh, of, of how those racial disparities look too? Sure. So um, in terms of the probability of being investigated by the child welfare system, um, there's about a 78% um, or so higher rate of investigation for Black children relative to white children. Um, and you see similar disparities for Native American children. Um, in general, Hispanic children tend to be investigated at similar rates as white children and Asian um, children at lower rates. So that's sort of the general picture. And um, once you're in the child welfare system, so you've been investigated, the decision making from there in terms of whether your case is substantiated, whether you enter foster care, there tend not to be massive uh, disparities at those decision points. And um, where they do exist, they tend to be in specific states or counties rather than a, a sort of national picture. Um, I would note that we do in other um, measures of risk of maltreatment or the occurrence of maltreatment, we see similar disparities. Um, for example, Black children are nearly three times more likely to experience a child maltreatment fatality uh, than our white children. And um, other estimates, um, for example, the National Incident Studies, which try to get an overall sense of how many children are maltreated, regardless of whether they come to the attention of child welfare, tends to find um, similar gaps in the occurrence of maltreatment. Mm. So, I mean, you know, just to, to re repeat a little bit what you said and then sort of dig a little further. So what you're saying is that the child welfare agencies are investigating the reports that they're getting and black children tend to experience maltreatment at a higher rate uh, than, than white children do. So can you, can we talk a little bit about why that is? We, we talked a few minutes ago about this question of of family structure, um, that uh, it, it does matter kind of who is living in the home with you. If you have um, a single mother and a non-relative male who's living in the house, uh, that that is a risk factor. Um, what, what are the other risk factors that you think might be leading to a higher rate of maltreatment for Black children? Um, yeah, so family structure is certainly one. Um, having a teen parent is another. Um, having a parent who is or is at risk of being incarcerated is another. Um, and then outside of parental behaviors, um, there are also environmental factors that matter here. So um, for example, if I live in a really dangerous neighborhood, I can't leave my child alone outside to play in the same way I can if I live in a neighborhood with a fenced in backyard. And, um, that's generally safe. So there are, there are structural barriers to child safety that are going to vary by racial group because of things like poverty. Um, so. So is that, um, you know, just to sort of play devil's advocate, is that unfair, the idea that we have different standards of what constitutes maltreatment in different places that, you know, for some parents, you know, letting their children you know, uh, go outside after dark is not unsafe at all. And for some parents, um, it, it's a clear risk uh, and we're gonna treat those cases differently. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge, right? Because in some ways it does feel unfair but the actual risk of harm to children is in fact different. And to pretend otherwise would mean providing different levels of protection or expectations for safety. Uh, depending on children's race or income status, and that also seems unfair. Hmm. 
So I just wanted to remind people uh, in about five minutes, we're gonna start turning to questions. I already see uh, a couple in the chat, but um, but if you have uh, questions, please just type them in and, and we'll get to them. Um, I wanted to sort of ask a, a sort of overarching question, which is you know really the second part of our topic today, which is what is the role of government here? So, um, you know, we are asking, uh, you know, questions about the, these kids who are at risk. And I think that, you know, there are a lot of people who worry that there's going to be too much government intrusion into the lives of families. Um, you know, in recent years, there's been a whole kind of move toward free range parenting and the idea that our kids need more independence. Um, and, you know, parents are, are concerned now about the way, uh, you know, schools are treating them, uh, you know, that they're um, trying to hide things from parents and they're trying to get parents in trouble for things. And, and this has sort of turned into kind of a political minefield, um, you know, uh, how how parents treat their children and how outside uh, either teachers or sociologists or researchers or activists kind of think they should treat their children. So I was wondering if you could just try to um, you know describe for us what you think the government's role here is and how we try to limit it to uh, you know protecting children from these kinds of harm. Yeah. So. Generally speaking, right, the threshold is if parents are providing minimally adequate care, the government is not allowed to intrude. Um, and so then the question is, where do we draw that threshold of minimally adequate care? And that's where some of the, the debates come into play. Um, my general perception is that we know that children who are experienced to, exposed to maltreatment, especially if it's repeated and chronic, um, they face challenges throughout the rest of their lives. They, when they have children, they face lots of challenges in parenting and it's an intergenerational problem. So there has to be some room for government to step in and say, let's try to break the cycle, uh, whatever that looks like. And ideally you can do that with the parent's cooperation, um, but that's just not always the case. It's not realistic. And we know um, from lots of studies that even when we have evidence-based interventions that are supposed to improve child safety, parents decline at very high rates or they don't finish them or they don't work. Well, that's, that's another sort of big buzzword right now is the idea that we can engage in prevention efforts and that kids will remain, uh, you know, in their homes and, you know, in a, in a, um, supervised if, you know, environment somehow, if we provide parents with enough of these um, training programs, um, whether it's anger management or parenting classes um, or addiction treatment. Um, just this is the last thing, and then I'm going to turn it turn to the questions in the chat. What do you see as the efficacy of some of these programs? Um, do you think we have a good chance at prevention um, if we if we catch uh, you know because obviously you know we're offering these programs typically to parents who've already been reported for maltreating their their children. So what what is your um, what is your sense of the likelihood of success of those kinds of programs? Uh, well, I certainly think that we should try and we should continue to try to create and improve uh, programs, but we should temper our expectations. Um, so the practices or programs that are listed, for example, on the Family First uh, Federal Clearinghouse for things that are supposed to keep children from needing to come into foster care, if you really dig into those numbers, most of them don't actually show any evidence that they improve child safety. Most of them get turned down, uh, meaning you know families say, no, we don't want that service at really high rates. Um, and the effect sizes are very small. So um, we, should, we should try those things certainly because that's the structure of our system is that we want to avoid intrusion um, in family life to the extent possible. But we should know that the there will be a lot of cases where it's not going to be enough. 
So um, one of our first questions uh, is for someone who is training to be a CASA in Arizona, and maybe we should talk about CASAs in a minute too. Um, but this person is asking um, about services for youth who are quote unquote graduating from the program or from foster, foster care, um, uh, saying that they're limited. Uh, will you please speak to this challenge as young adults attempt to take on life responsibilities on their own after living in foster care environments. So um, just for those of you kind of uh, who are not as familiar with the child welfare system, uh, CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocate. Um, those are folks who are um, supposed to really represent the, um, uh, the best interests of the child in court. Uh, they're specifically often tasked by the judge with going to see the child on a regular, sometimes weekly basis, finding out what, what it's like living at home with them, uh, you know, what, what the different adults in their lives are doing. Um, and uh, anyway, so thank you for volunteering as a CASA. Um, and in terms of the question of youth who are graduating or what we call aging out in the system, um, you know, Sarah, could you talk a little bit about kind of what, what are the prospects for those young people? A lot of states have recently added years uh, to the amount of time that kids can remain in care and continue to receive, uh, you know, financial benefits and um, an education uh, and other benefits through the foster care system. But many youth obviously are so sick of the system by the time they get to be 17 or 18 that they want out of it. Um, so can you can you talk about, um, you know, what are the what are the prospects for youth aging out? Yeah, so let me say a couple of things. Um, one is that aging out is relatively rare. Um, the vast majority of youth who age out of care entered foster care as teenagers. And because they entered as teenagers, they often have the least supportive foster care environments. They're more likely to be in group care. Um, they have a much longer history of trauma um, that needs to be um, you know, treated and supported, you know, their healing supported before they get to the point that they're aging out. So the best thing that CASAs can really do is push that before they get to the point they're aging out um, to try to focus on things like placement stability, having permanent connections, ideally with um, parent figures, and um, you know, addressing their mental health needs before they reach 18. Um, at 18, right, they can stay in the system if they are engaged in education or work in the vast majority of states, um, but uptake rates are low. Um, and partly they're low because um, of not wanting to be associated with the system, but also because some of the requirements to maintain eligibility are um, difficult to navigate, especially for youth who do have serious mental um, or physical health challenges. So helping navigate those structures is really important. Um, the last thing is, agencies often understate the amount uh, or availability of people to help youth in those situations. They say, we can't find a place for this youth, or we can't find, um, you, know, um, you know, a support system for this youth. I don't really believe that that's true, um, because I hear all the time about how much need there is. And I know lots of people who have been licensed foster parents, myself included, who said, I will fill that role and never got a call. Um, so I think forcing the system to reckon with what their resources are and using them effectively um, is really needed. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, this sort of leads into the, the next question maybe. Um, so if a, if a kid is 16 and he lives in a state in which he was removed from group housing, where does he or she go? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what that question means in this particular instance, but it might be useful for us to talk about um, group homes and and congregate care and kind of, um, you know, how many kids who are in foster care are living with families uh, versus and uh, some some of them are living with extended relatives um, and some of them are living uh, in a kind of group home setting or even um, something more restrictive if they, there's a mental illness or behavioral health challenge too. Um, Sarah, I was wondering if you could kind of maybe break down just so because I think maybe people have a sense that there are a lot more kids living in a group home facilities than there are as opposed to foster families. Maybe if you could kind of break down the numbers for us and, and talk about what the role of the group home is here. 
Sure. So um, it is extremely rare for a child under the age of 10 to be in a group or residential facility. After that, um, once we get into the adolescent and teen years, um, it ranges a lot by state, with some states having the majority of their teens in non-family care and others having it, um, you know, much lower, more like 20 percent. So there, there is a lot of, um, there, there's some variability there. Um, so group care is generally restricted to situations where you cannot find a safe or appropriate alternative. And sometimes that's because um, the child is engaged in self-harm behaviors or substance use or other things that make them um, unsafe for a family-like environment. Um, Sometimes that can even include um, children who, you know, are, are violent or have um, engaged in some level of juvenile offending um, that would that would make a family environment inappropriate. Um, in other cases, it's simply because the state or local agency says we cannot recruit enough families who will take teens. Um, whether that is a, a real constraint that there aren't enough families or whether the state is not engaging in the level of effort needed is not entirely clear. Yeah, um, we are, we're, and we're also going to be, uh, one of our later sessions um, is going to be with somebody who works for a faith-based nonprofit um, that does a lot of uh, kind of an umbrella organization that helps organizations recruit and train and support uh, foster families. Um, so we're gonna sort of get a little bit more into that discussion specifically um, uh, a little bit further into into the into the fall. Um, one of the one of the questions here is about um, the role foster care can play in mentally disturbed or challenged children. Um, and I'm not sure if the if the question is whether those are children who are experiencing um, disturbance because perhaps of, of a foster care experience or because, or whether those are children who are, who have some kind of mental illness problem and then are in the foster care system. But um, one thing I wanted to highlight, Sarah, you mentioned earlier there there are a disproportionate number of kids who are in the foster care system and who experience maltreatment who have some kind of disability. Um, can you talk a little bit about that disparity and why you think that's there? Yeah, so partly, um... Right, so children with disabilities are at higher risk of experiencing maltreatment um, in some cases because their needs are more intensive, so their parents are less able to meet them um, with, their, with limited capacities, and partly because um, they can be more challenging to provide care for, so they're at greater risk for things like physical abuse when parents um, are frustrated or overwhelmed. Um, so then they come into foster care, um, and does foster care increase the probability of having some of those problems? There's not strong evidence to suggest that the answer is yes, and there is good evidence to believe that the answer is no. Um, so I am happy to share some additional um, resources on that question, but by and large, um, foster care is not a cause of mental or behavioral health problems. Um, it does not always adequately compensate for those when they exist, but there's um, not good evidence that it um, leads to them and rather good evidence that children are presenting to the system already having all of those concerns because of their history of maltreatment. Yeah, I think more broadly, I think that's an important point. I think people read a lot of uh, articles about the outcomes of kids in foster care, whether it's um, you know lower rates of high school graduation or rates of employment um, or uh, you know a higher level of experience of some kind of um, sex trafficking or other kind of victimization, um, and they assume that it is the foster care system that is to blame for those um, disturbing outcomes, um, but it does not take account of the fact that those kids have often experienced years of maltreatment before the foster care system even entered their lives or before they entered the foster care system. Um, how do you think we should think about that? Um, you know, which is to say, um, you know, when you, when you, when you think about um, the fact that these kids are experiencing all this maltreatment um, before they, they enter foster care, do you think we are 
um, over investigating? Are we over removing or are we waiting too long? Are we giving kids too much time uh, or giving parents too much time to rehabilitate before we determine that a child needs to be removed. Because, you know, one of the things people I think don't realize when we talk about the numbers of kids in foster care is that that's a number that as public policymakers, we can make it go up or down. I mean, there was just a story, the governor of Kansas um, uh, has, ex they've experienced in Kansas all sorts of bad child welfare outcomes, but the governor there bragged that over the last few years, there have been 1,500 fewer kids in foster care than when she started as governor. Um, you know, a lot of governors could magically, you know, sort of snap their fingers and make that happen. Um, should they? And you know, what what do you think? Um, you know, we're, how do you think we're doing in terms of how aggressively uh, the child welfare system is working? Yeah, so one of my, I think, biggest frustrations in terms of the policy infrastructure, um, the set of incentives around child welfare is that the incentives are overwhelmingly pushed in the direction of doing nothing. Um, so states can pat themselves on the back when they lower their foster care populations, regardless of how much more or less safe children are. And um, there's a lot of reasons that they would do this. Um, when you bring a child into foster care, you assume all of the right responsibilities for care of that child. Um, and states can and often are sued when they fail to provide that level of care. But if you go into a home and you say, I'm gonna ignore everything that's happening here and the state does not take custody, no one can turn around and sue the state for failing that child. They can only sue the state for failing a child that they have taken custody of. So the incentives to do nothing are massive. Um, and so um, for that reason, right, we do often wait too long to intervene, I think. Um, and I've seen this both in practice, and I think you see this in the data when you see children coming into foster care who have had, you know, three, four, or five prior investigations um, since birth, basically, and now they're 10. And, um, you know, they have pretty significant challenges at that point. Um, yeah. So there's a, the another, another question here that um, it seems quite specific, but let me broaden it a little bit um, about the, the continued contact of children who have been adopted by another family uh, with a birth parent. Um, uh, do you think that it's best for continued contact to happen? And by the way, I mean, um, you know, there, there is, uh, you know, our society has sort of trended much more in the direction, obviously, of open adoption. And, you know, many of these kids, you know, know who they're, even if they were adopted at a young age, like they'll, they'll know who their parents are. Um, what do you think about the role of kind of continued contact uh, in these relationships? Uh, I think it depends. Uh, and so there are certainly scenarios where an open adoption is going to be appropriate. And because the reality is that there are parents who acknowledge that they are not capable of providing a safe or appropriate life for a child, but they're appropriate and safe to the extent of being um, involved with the child's life in some way. So um, sometimes this is the case with parents who have serious um, mental illness. Uh, or a serious intellectual disability, for example, they're not able to provide the full parent um, parenting that a child needs, but they can still be involved. They're not a danger to the child to visit, right? Uh, so in those cases, that can be um, meaningful for the child. It can help them um, stay connected to their origins, all of those things. Um, and in other cases, it's just really not appropriate. Um, the parent, um, you know, can continue to be engaged in activities that put the child at risk, um, crime, uh, drugs, et cetera. And in those cases, it's not appropriate. In other cases, the parent is so unreliable um, that it's emotionally damaging to the child. So um, the parent says they'll show up and they don't. They say they show up and they don't. Um, those sort of situations, it's appropriate for the adoptive parents to say, this is, this is, not, this is not helpful. Um, so certainly the policies that are attempting to force adoptive parents into some sort of lower tier of parenthood where they have to have those ongoing connections is totally, uh, in my view, totally inappropriate. Yeah, there was a um, New York State recently considered a law like that, and both uh, houses of our legislature actually passed it. The governor 
vetoed it, but um, but it, it, I think it definitely gave people pause. Uh, you know, if you again, you know, sort of yeah, make adoptive parents kind of a lower level of parenting that these other people now have um, influence over the lives of their children, they don't get to say who it is um, or or how that happens. Um, there, there is a question here that probably is a good question for us to end on. I don't know whether it's directed toward you or me, but uh, how did you get into this line of work? Just curious. So um, I'll, I'll let you go first and then, and then I'll offer my, uh, my explanation. Sure. Uh, so I finished my master's in social work in uh, 2008. And I lived in Michigan at the time. And Michigan had just settled a massive class action lawsuit or was in the process of doing so. Uh, with their child welfare system, and they had to hire 500 new caseworkers. Um, so I ended up being one of those caseworkers. And uh, once I got into the system, um, it was like banging my head against the wall every day. Um, and knowing that this cannot be the best that we can do for kids. Um, so then I went back to school, got my PhD, and uh, have been trying to figure out how to uh, fix that ever since. Wow. Uh, well, I um, I sort of have had a number of other uh, things that I've done research on. Uh, this has always been in the back of my mind for a long time. But uh, one of the books I wrote before this was actually about American Indians. Um, and for those of you who don't know, American Indians have some of the worst child welfare outcomes in the country, um, uh, highest rates of um, physical and sexual abuse, uh, substance abuse on uh, reservations and in other Indian territories is very hard um, uh, to even quantify, but it's it's very widespread. And um, and then there's also just a not enough um, responsible adults in some of these communities to care for kids who need to be in foster care or need to be adopted. Um, and so just sort of researching that made me wonder kind of what the rest of the system looked like. Um, hoping that it was better. Uh, alas, in many cases, it was not. Um, but I, uh, I then went to um, the American Enterprise Institute and I said, I really think that someone should be uh, doing some work on this. Um, uh, from a conservative perspective, I, I was disappointed to see that uh, the only folks who are at the table discussing these things in a public policy setting uh, were, were people on, on the left. Not that I, you know, I, I think that we should be able to come together on these issues. Um, but I, I thought the right had kind of, um, I don't know, uh, sort of fallen away from its responsibility here. I think a lot of people thought, you know, this is the result of a lot of drug abuse and a lot of family breakdown, um, which I think is very true, but also totally insufficient as a public policy answer. Um, so anyway, I, I came to AEI a few years ago and uh, yeah, I got to meet people like Sarah and it's been great. Um, so I wanted to just uh, wrap up a little bit here. I want to encourage you to please sign up for our future seminars. The next one is going to be on October 11th. Um, it's going to be with Ronald Richter, um, who is a former head of the Administration for Children's Services, which uh, oversees child welfare in New York City. Um, I see, you, can, you can see the link is actually up in the chat now. Um, he was also a family court judge for many years um, and now actually runs a congregate care facility um, uh, for kids in foster care, uh, kids who are developmentally uh, disabled, um, kids who have experienced sex trafficking. Um, so he really has kind of the full spectrum of, you know, experience in the child welfare system. And I encourage you to tune in. We're going to talk a little bit about the family court system, about congregate care. Um, and, uh, you know, please come with your questions. I really appreciate all of you participating today. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sarah. Thanks for having me.